Happy Pride everyone and welcome to the Rust 1.70 release train. We have some awesome updates for Rust 1.70 and some bonus content at the end for those that stick around. If you've ever run into the issue, most likely in CI environments, of cargo being slow to update the crates.io registry, you'll be happy to know that the sparse protocol is the default in Rust 1.70. It's important to note that this will change the crate cache path, so you'll have to freshly download all of your dependencies. The newly defaulted option was already stabilized in Rust 1.68 and is just becoming default in 1.70, so if you've had this problem before, you've probably already switched and seen the speed improvements from doing so. After committing to using the new sparse registry update, you can also clear out the old registry path. But once cell and once lock are what I'm most excited about in this release. In the past for this problem, I've used third-party crates like Lazy Static, but the implementation in the once cell third-party crate has now been reformulated to be used in the standard library. Because while Rust is moving closer and closer to more and more const-capable items, some data in your program won't be constable. And this is where once cell and once lock come in. These new data structures are for one-time initialization of shared data. And here's what that looks like. This example uses scoped threads, which I have another video going deeper into if you would like more information on that. But for this example, we'll be focusing on once lock. This example uses standard sync once lock, which is one of the new data structures, to create a static called winner. This once lock is going to contain a string slice and we'll initialize it on line three. Then in our main function, we get to use the new scoped threads implementation. Inside of the scoped threads, we spawn a thread that then tries to set the value of winner. We yield the thread that we're in, and then we get or init, which is one of the functions on the once lock data structure. Finally, we print out whichever one of these wins or whichever one has set the value first. We're seeing two functions in the API here. One is set and one is get or init. Set will set the value, while get or init will either get the value if it exists or initialize it with the value that you give it. In this sense, we're taking the opportunity to initialize our value the first time our program runs and needs to access it. If we build this program and then we run it, we can see that in this case, main one. But if we loop and we call that multiple times, we can see that sometimes thread wins and sometimes main wins. That's because we've effectively created a race condition here to set the value to whatever it's going to initialize to. And if we cancel this, we can see thread wins sometimes and main wins other times when we run the program. IsTerminal is another example of taking functionality from a third-party crate and reformulating it to work inside of the standard library. IsTerminal is a trait, which means you can implement it for data structures like standard out or your own custom types but it's easiest to understand what's happening here with an example. On the right here, we're setting a variable use color to the is terminal result of standard out. Standard out gives us back the standard out struct, which implements the is terminal trait. We're then taking that use color variable and printing it to standard out, as well as debugging it to standard error. I've chosen to debug it to standard error for a reason we'll see in a second. If we build that program and run it, then we can see the standard output true, interleaved with the standard error output from debug, which shows us use color equals true. But the key difference between this and what would normally happen is that if we pipe the output of our program to another program, say in this case, I'm piping TTY170, which is the name of the example, to PB copy, which is the copy to clipboard command on a Mac. And you can see that when we run it, we see use color equals false from debug, but the standard out has been copied to the clipboard, not outputted to the terminal. So after having run it and I'm pasting, we get false from our clipboard. So you can use is terminal to determine whether you are operating on a TTY, which means that you can determine whether your program is running in interactive mode in a terminal or being piped as output to another program. This can be useful, for example, showing a TUI if you're in interactive mode and outputting maybe JSON if you're interacting with another program. The debug info compiler option can now be set by name instead of number. Previously, we had zero, one, and two, but now we have none, limited, and full. In addition, we have two new options, line directives only and line tables only. And when running cargo test, you used to be able to specify unstable options. And in some cases you had to. This was only meant to be enabled on nightly versions of the Rust compiler. And so that functionality has been removed. This particularly impacts the JSON output format, which does have people paying attention who do seem like they're working towards stabilizing that format. And that format may undergo some changes between now and when it's actually stabilized which is exactly what you would expect from an unstable feature and exactly why it's restricted to nightly. Moving on from Rust 1.70, there was an interesting experimental RFC merged recently for single file packages. The short name for these being cargo script. What this means is the ability to use cargo in a shebang inside of a single RS file to run a Rust program. This is super exciting for me and I'd love to have a little bit less machinery around my one-off scripts. But that's it for Rust 1.70 today. Happy Pride and I'll see you in another six weeks. Have a great rest of your day.